All right, we are in Genesis 7 today. Genesis 7. I ask you to turn there. We're going to read the text here in a moment and then uh, work through some of the central uh, theological and historical and spiritual uh, implications of this text. Uh, and after we read it and, and do some uh, summary up to this point, is where we're gonna. I'm gonna. I want to. I want to back out for a moment and view how Moses has structured this whole narrative, because that's going to help us, uh, especially in chapter seven, see what the major thrust is, and even uh, the next couple weeks in eight and nine, particularly eight, uh, it will help as well. So uh, chapter seven, uh, verses one through twenty-four, the whole chapter, and so I'm going to ask for another volunteer who will volunteer to read chapter seven. Anybody willing to read? That's why you volunteered to pray. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. Okay. So uh, as he reads, I want you to pay attention to something in particular. Pay attention to repetition that happens in this chapter. In other words, um, record of particular things that are stated and then stated again and maybe even stated again. And just sort of begin to ask yourself question, questions about why Moses would do this. Is this intentional? Is this not intentional? Spoiler alert, it's intentional. Um, well, why? Why Why would why would he almost repeat himself in several cases? Because we're, we're going to look at this in just a moment. All right? So, chapter 7. Let's listen. Then the Lord said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and all your household, for I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. Take with you seven pairs of all clean animals, the male and his mate, and a pair of the animals that are not clean, the male and his mate, and seven pairs of the birds of the heavens also, male and female, to keep their offspring alive on the face of, the, of all the earth. For in seven days I will send rain on the four, on each, on, on the earth, forty days and forty nights, and every living thing that I have made I will blot out from the face of the ground. And Noah did all that the Lord had commanded him. Noah was 600 years old when the flood waters came upon the earth, and Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives went with him into the ark to escape the waters of the flood. Of the clean animals and of the animals that are not clean, and of birds and of everything that creeps on the ground, two and two, male and female, went into the ark with Noah, as God had commanded Noah. And after the seven days, the water of the flood came upon the earth. But in the six hundredth year of Noah's in the six hundredth year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the seventeenth day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep burst forth, and the windows of heaven were opened, and rain fell upon the earth forty days and forty nights. On the very same day, Noah and his sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Noah's wife, and three wives of his sons, with them entered the ark. They and every beast according to its kind, and all the livestock according to their kinds, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth according to its kind, and every bird according to its kind, every winged creature. They went into the ark of Noah, two and two of all flesh, in which there was a breath of life. And those that entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut them in. The flood continued forty days on the earth, the waters increased. And bore up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. The waters prevailed and increased greatly on the earth, and the ark floated on the face of the waters. And the waters prevailed so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed above the mountains, covering them fifteen cubits deep. And all flesh died that moved on the earth birds, livestock, beasts, all swarming creatures that swarmed on the earth, and all mankind. Everything on the dry land, in whose nostrils was the breath of death, died. He blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the ground, man and animals, and creeping things, and birds of the heavens. They were blotted out from earth. Only Noah was left, and those who were with him in the ark. And the waters prevailed on the earth 150 days. Okay. All right. So we'll, we'll come back to that question about uh, repetition here in a moment. So keep that in your mind. First, I just want to point out, so what I have up here on the board, and let me just go ahead and share this. Well, I don't, yeah, okay. I don't want to give it away yet, but I guess I will. Um, share. Where is it? There it is. Okay. 
Well, that's weird. Well, hold on. There we go. Okay. Um, I don't know why this is. There we go. Let's just minimize that. Okay. So what I have here is from 613 all the way through 822. So last week's material, this week's material, uh, and next week's material is 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 the Noah narrative. And if you think about it, this is this is a large section in the book of Genesis. In fact, the Noah narrative covers as much space. So this is just one man's life and what happens in the flood covers just as much space as the space covered from from Adam to Noah. That's that's many, many, many generations and the space that will be covered from Noah all the way to Abraham in terms of what is recorded in the book of Genesis. So clearly, this is a significant narrative, one that God through Moses, God and Moses wants to emphasize, wants us to pay attention to. And, and once again, it's important to remind ourselves of the original audience, too, of the book of Genesis, of the entire Pentateuch. To whom is Moses originally writing? To the people of Israel, very likely just before they're about to cross over into the promised land. So they've, they've experienced the Sinai event. They've been given the law. They've been given the tabernacle. They had 40 years of wilderness wandering. And now they're about to go over into the land that God has promised to them. We've pointed out up to this point, particularly in chapter one and chapter two, the specific language that Moses uses that ties into this promised land and gives them hope and confidence that God will keep his covenant promises to them. Uh, we've pointed out, uh, um, and this, this is of particular significance for our text today, that in chapter three, after Adam and Eve fall into sin, in the curse upon the serpent, God essentially divides all of humanity into two groups. What are those two groups? Sons of Adam and sons of the serpent. Seed of the serpent and, and seed of the women, woman, actually. But yes, I mean, that would be uh, Adam as well. Uh, and those are representative of, obviously, the unbelieving people of the world, people who do not submit themselves in a covenant relationship with God through the means that he has prescribed. That would be the seed of the serpent. And the seed of the woman being uh, ultimately uh, uh, climaxing in a seed singular, the Messiah someday, but as we saw, there's also a plural aspect in that all of the followers of Yahweh, again, through the means that he has prescribed in order to uh, have covenant with them, we'll see that again today, are the seed of the woman. And so, all, and, and God specifically says, I will put enmity between these two lines. So pause for a moment. Everything that's going on today in the Middle East is because of that. But it's not just the Middle East, right? It's not unique to the Middle East. All conflict throughout the history of humankind ultimately traces down to this enmity between those who follow God and his law and those who refuse to follow God and his law, the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. And so we see that, that Moses is highlighting that enmity then right at the beginning. Cain and Abel is the first illustration of this enmity, Abel being representative of the seed of the woman, Cain being representative of the seed of the serpent, as we saw a couple weeks ago, then in chapter four, after Cain kills Abel, Cain establishes a city, right? God even shows his common grace to unbelieving people, particularly with the institutions of family and, and city, state, uh, Cain establishes a, 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 a city. Uh, he essentially is the king of that city. And the first part of chapter four, the second, excuse me, the second half of chapter four sort of lays out the dynasty of Cain and shows the distortion of the, the seed of the serpent in both, you know, climaxing with Lamech and his polygamy, distorting the common grace institution of family, and in the distortion of the common grace institution of the city, the state. Chapter So that's that's the seed of the serpent, right? The, Moses is tracing that line and showing its devolution. Chapter 5 gives the line of Seth, with, which represents the seed of the woman, right? Over and over again in that chapter, we find Enoch walked with God. We find that this godly line of Seth is representative of the seed of the woman, those who put their faith in God through the means that he has prescribed and the revelation that he has given to them. But there's this conflict 
And this conflict between the, the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman then reaches its climax during the time of Moses. And that's what we're finally seeing happening in chapter uh, six and particularly seven. We're seeing this come to a climax where the seed of the serpent is not only rejecting the redemptive promises of God, they're not submitting to Yahweh through the, the atoning means that he has prescribed, but they're also, as we saw, distorting even the common grace means, and they're beginning to, to, to seek to wipe out those who follow Yahweh, the, the, the seed of the woman. And so God, as we're going to see in this text, finally steps in. God will not withhold his wrath for long, and he will save his people, right? That's his promise. He holds back his wrath for a time. That's common grace because he is bringing more into his redemptive people. And he's showing this grace even to people who reject him. And yet God will not forever withhold his wrath. And he will punish those who resist him. But not only will he punish those who resist him, he also will save those who are righteous, who do uh, who have entered into covenant relationship with him. And so as we pointed out several times, there are so many parallels between Moses' day and our day, right? We still have true, two groups of people, those to reject God and those who submit to God. There's conflict between these two groups of people. We look around us and we say, why are these people getting away with it, right? Why do, why do people who hate God continue to seem like they are succeeding god is withholding his wrath and so we might be tempted to wonder is god going to actually punish sin is god going to actually save us that was the temptation for moses's day that's a temptation for our day and as we're going to see peter and specifically in the new testament um recognizes that temptation and specifically points to this period to urge us to believe in the promises of God. God will not withhold his wrath forever. One day, the wrath of God will come. He will destroy all of his enemies. But we need not, not fear, because that same destruction of his enemies is the means by which he will save his people. And that's what we're going to see in this text um, today. Okay, so now, <clears throat> this gets us to look at this narrative and to really hone in on what is the central message of the narrative. And we're getting to the central message. It already started all the way back, the way back in, in, in chapter 6, this whole flood narrative, and it won't be done until chapter 8. We're right in the middle of it. It's important for us to ask the question, what is the central message of this narrative? Yes? Uh, well, it seems like because it, it does it does repeat and it, it also the creation story seems a little repetitive. Too. Okay. And I think it's just it's it's reminding us that there are some a small remnant that is saved. Okay. And then we have that repeated where all of these others are not. So we see the the mention of those whom he will save repeated. Right. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um. What what else did you notice that that is repeated almost as if like why is he saying it again? Did you notice anything else in in the in our chapter today that seemed a bit repetitive? The animals. The okay, lots of emphasis on on the animals. Okay, good. It almost seems like the flood started and then stopped and started and then stopped. Okay. It, it almost reiterated. Yes. The amount of time it was until they it, it flooded for this long, but then you see them they go into the ark and then seven days later it started. Okay, so you're you're getting on two two of them in, in particular. Them going into the ark, it's sort of stated, and then it's almost like, wait, they're not in there yet, because then it's stated again, and, and then, you know, it almost seems repetitive. Mm -hmm. The start of the flood seems to happen in a couple different times, right? So there's this, there's this unusual sort of repeating of material as if it hasn't already been stated. I mean, some of these things, like the emphasis on God saving his people, you can understand why he's stating it over and over again. It's not it's not really repetition in chronology. It's just repetition in, in emphasis. Same with the nature of the animals. But with the, the entrance into the ark and with the start of the flood, where we're talking chronology, why would he state it? And then it seemed like it hasn't happened yet. And then he stated it again. Right. Let me let me point these out to you uh, particularly. So, for example, chapter seven. Verse five, Noah goes into the ark. I mean, verse one, God says, go in. And then verse five says, he, he did what God 
God commanded. So it seems like, okay, in verse 5, he entered the ark. But then in verse 7, it says again, he entered the ark. And it's already said in verse 6, the flood of the waters came on the earth. So what 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 is the order here? Did the flood come first? Did he enter? I thought he already entered in verse 5. And then in verse 10, okay, here now here comes the flood. Wait, but he it seemed like he said that already in, in verse 6, right? So when exactly did the flood come? And then in verse 13, they're entering the ark again. Like, what's going on here? Why? why he, he, I already said like twice before that he entered the ark, right? And then in verse 17, the flood uh, is mentioned again. And then in verse 18, we have this emphasis on the fact that the waters prevail. So we have this kind of weird thing that's going on that for some people, I think it's very easily explained. And in fact, powerfully explained, as we'll see in a moment. But for some people, this presents a bit of a challenge. When you look at the, uh, the first chapter, it says God said, and then he says it, and then he repeats it, and then this happens. Okay. It's exactly verbatim what he said would happen. So is that what we're seeing here? That's like part of it. This, and then it's taking place exactly as he said. Uh, that's part of it, although it almost it does seem like they do it, and then, oh, they're not in there yet. And then the flood starts, and then, wait, now they're entering the ark again. And then, you know, so that that is part of it, but I think there's something bigger going on. Yeah. Could it be the different categories of those entering the, un the unclean enter, then the clean enter, then the saved people enter? Yeah. Um, maybe, maybe. And some of it echoing back to chapter one and God's creating all the okay. categories. Okay, and so also there... just notice his repetition of ground and the earth. Yes, is is important with everything we've seen about the land and promised. Good. Yeah. Okay. So let, let me let me show you what I think is going on. Because because here's again the point. You want to center in on what the main thrust of the text is, which, by the way, is not uh, you know, this is one of the first stories we teach our children when they're young, right? Noah in the ark, right? And what's usually the way we portray Noah in the ark? Like precious moments, cute little cuddly animals, little giraffe, you know, <laughs> sticking out of the top of the ark, you know. Um, it's sort of a cute, is that is that the message of Noah in the ark, right? In fact, those of you who have been to the, the ark in, um, in Kentucky, there's, and uh, so maybe some of you will go in February, uh, there's a whole display in the ark museum of probably 300 children's books about the ark and all these cutesy little pictures and things like that and the whole point of the display is that's not the message what is the message well this repetition and what moses is doing with this is helping to center us in on the message what it helps us to determine so you can see this on the screen here for those of you at home and those of you over here kind of maybe or over here on the board when you look at the whole narrative from chapter 6, verse 13 through chapter 8, verse 22, what we find is that the narrative is very clearly divided into seven sections. And we determine those sections based on where these repetitions occur. There's very clear, clearly delineated sections that begin all the way in the material we covered last week, John covered last week, and that will go all the way through 8, uh, uh, verse 22. Now, what what are the main themes of these material uh, of these sections? Because what is interesting, I've I've showed you in a sort of stair step fashion. Sometimes this is referred to as as a chiastic structure, which just comes from the Greek letter chi, which is it looks like an X, and you can see how it follows the the the, the side of the X, right? And what it shows is you see here, even if you can't read it, you can see it. Section one and section seven are parallel sections. What do we find in section one? Well, chapter six, verses 13 through 22 is the building of the ark that was covered last week, right? So that's that's section one. Section seven, which we'll see, I think, next week, um, Steve will be teaching, is the building of the altar. So in both cases, Noah is building something. The first section, he's constructing the ark. And, the, and section seven, he's constructing the altar of consecration. Okay, so those are parallel sections. Now we get into our material this week. Section two 
is the first five verses of chapter seven. And as we saw that last verse, verse five, Noah did what God commanded. He went into the ark. He, he, you know, every, he, he did it. But then we see them going into the ark again later. Right. So that's what happens in chapter uh, seven, verses one through five. There's one major focus of section two, and that is the the embarking onto the ark, the entrance into the ark. That's the major theme, one major theme. OK, that is parallel with section six, chapter eight, verse 15 through 19. And that's when they leave the ark. So you can see how those two are clearly parallels going into the ark, leaving the ark. Both of those sections just having one main theme. Now, section three begins to help us understand why there's repetition. Verses six through 12 of chapter seven repeats entrance into the ark again. So it repeats the theme of section two, but then it adds an additional theme, and that is the coming of the flood. So section three has two themes, entrance into the ark, and the added theme is the beginning of the flood. That's parallel with section five, chapter eight, verses one through 14, which has two themes, a cessation of the flood and a cessation of the prevailing waters. Well, where does that theme of prevailing waters come in? That brings us to this middle point, which is section four of the, uh, of the structure, verses 13 through 24. And this section has three major subject matters, two of which have already been covered. The entrance to the ark again. So the entrance of the ark is mentioned in section two and three and four. And as we saw, the mention of the flood is in three and four. And then we have this final sort of climactic statement in section four, that middle section. And that is that the waters prevail above the mountain. Okay, so do you see what's happening here? We have one theme. It repeats that theme and adds another theme. This middle one repeats both of these themes and adds another one. Now, here's what happens following that. Section five, it removes one of those themes, only has two of the themes. Chapter six, it's just one of the themes. Okay. Does that remind you of anything? Does that sound like anything? Do you see, see what's happening here? It's sort of building one theme repeat that theme, add another one, repeat both of those and add a third one. That's the climax. And now we're removing one theme and we're removing one thing. Seems like a really good way to remember something. Okay, it's a really good way to remember some something just sort of strategically. Poetry. Music. Poetry, right? This, this clearly is a poetic, structural way of describing things. Don't you see the chiastic structure repeated in New Testament specifically when the, uh, they're speaking to the Hebrew people because it's kind of since yeah there's a there's a lot of passages in scripture that that have this kind of chiasm but but there's two things going on here there's the chiasm going on which is you know these are parallel these are parallel these are parallel and that one is in the middle okay so that's one thing going on that's going to help us determine that this middle is what the main point is but then there's also this this adding of themes this repetition of themes and building and then coming back down again does that remind you of anything that's actually happening in the text Flood. The flood, right? It's almost like like a wave. You know, if you if, if you've ever gone to the ocean and you see the waves because of the tide, right? The wave will come in and then go out, and then come in and cover that period, but add more and go out, and then come in and do the both of those, right? And then when the tide's going out, the reverse happens, right? That's exactly what Moses is doing poetically in this text. He is picturing sort of the, the the flood of the water growing, sort of increasing and then increasing and then increasing and then it decreases and it decreases and it decreases. Moses is obviously under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Moses is brilliantly in a poetic way picturing in the very nature of the text and how he is communicating these ideas. He's picturing what is happening in the flood. Now, this is important for a couple of reasons. Number one, uh, you know, many atheists or um, or even sort of liberal Christians who are not really Christians, when they look at Genesis, particularly a text like this, and all of this repetition, like, well, are they in the ark or are they not in the ark? They already said he went in the ark, and then all of a sudden they're out of the ark again and they go back in. 
they'll usually try to use that as a way to prove that this is this was just different myths that were kind of floating around and sometime later it, you know, much later in Israel's history somebody came along and said we're going to invent this new religion and kind of pulled these myths together and they were pretty sloppy in doing it and so they repeated it they repeated themselves and there just lacks co coherence in this text but I hope you can see that nothing is further from the truth there is deliberate intentionality between how this text is structured. It's beautifully portrayed. Ironically, you know, usually atheists or liberal scholars who are trying to attack the Bible will either take that tactic or they will say, well, Moses couldn't have written this because this is far too complex for some, you know, bumpkin in, in Moses' day to be able to write. Uh, well, you can't have it both ways. Either it's complex or it's not complex. And the fact of the matter is, it is very complex, and Moses absolutely could have, and we know because the New Testament tells us, did write this. I mean, think about Moses' level of education. He was no country bumpkin. Who was he educated by? The same people that built the pyramids, right? That civilization was, was very developed and complex. Moses was, in the providence of God, educated by the Egyptians. He had literary skills. He had uh, clearly intelligence and leadership skills that God all had ordained as this leader of Israel. And so he is writing this text deliberately with, with a beautiful poetic way of describing the nature of the flood. But what it also shows us, as I, I alluded to before, is that typically in a chiastic structure like this, what the intention is, is to point to the middle. There's parallels, and these two are parallel, and these two are parallel, and now this one right in the middle is where the focus is. And what is the focus in that middle section, section four, verses 13 through 24? It is the prevailing of the judgment waters. The message of the flood is not cute and cuddly animals and a cruise. The message of the flood is judgment. I used to bring this out in classes I would teach on aesthetics and I would show I would show students like a picture of precious moments, you know, Noah, and say, is this true? And the answer is no. I mean, yes, there's a boat and animals. At that level, it's true. But it's not artistically true. It's not capturing the message of, of Noah and the ark. And then I would show them a picture that that Rembrandt painted where there's the, there's an ark out there, but what the focus is on the painting is the people who are experiencing the judgment of God. The waters are coming over them and they're, they're, you know, their hands are raised, gripping to rocks, trying to escape the judgment of God. The message of Noah and the ark is not cute and cuddly. The message is judgment. But it's important for us, and this is where we'll spend the rest of our time, to get at the heart of the nature of the judgment in this text. What is the nature of this judgment? Because it's not just indiscriminate judgment. We've seen there's a whole buildup in chapters four through six that lead us to conclude God absolutely was righteous in this judgment. The people were doing what was right in their own eyes. They were resisting God's righteous rule and they were oppressing God's people, the seed of the woman. They deserve this judgment. It is not indiscriminate judgment. But not only is it not indiscriminate judgment, it's also important to recognize in this text, and this gets to the point that Katie was making earlier in some of the repetition, this is a redemptive judgment. This is a, this is a judgment in which the very nature of what God used to judge the people who, res, who were resisting him also is the means by which he saves his people. And as we saw all the way back in chapter 5 with how Moses records the line of Seth, and then even into chapter 6, how is Noah described? Noah is described as one who finds favor in the sight of God. Noah is described as a righteous man, one who has submitted himself by faith to the rule of God and submitted himself to the law of God. And that is exactly why uh, last week in chapter 6, verse 18, God establishes the covenant with Noah. But I will establish a covenant with you. You shall come into the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. This is a covenant of salvation. 
This is a promise of salvation in the midst of the judgment that is to come. Now, in a couple weeks, in chapter 9, we're going to see another covenant that God makes with Noah. It's not a covenant of salvation. It's a common grace covenant that God gives to all humankind, right? And we, the sign of that covenant is what? The rainbow. Is that something just unique for the people of God? No, that's the sign given to all people. Now, as we're seeing in our day, and this is this happens over and over and over again. God shows common grace to all people. And what do unbelieving people do? They distort God's common grace. They do it with the family. They do it with the government. They do it with the rainbow, right? That's what unbelieving people do. And that, again, not only should the rainbow remind us that God will never judge the world with a flood again, again, but it should also remind us judgment is coming. And God is going to judge those unbelieving people who distort even the com common grace promises uh, with them. But this covenant that God establishes with Noah in chapter 6 that we're now seeing fulfilled in chapter 7 is a covenant of salvation. And Noah enters into this covenant by faith. That is the only means of salvation. The only means of salvation is faith in the saving promises of God. We see this over and over again repeated. Uh, one of one of them earlier and then three and three in our in our chapter, six verse twenty two. Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. God said, do this and you will live. What is, what is Noah's response? I'll do it. And then in our text, chapter 7, verse 5, Noah did all that the Lord had commanded him. Verse 9, two, two and two, male and female, went into the ark with Noah as God commanded Noah. Verse 16, and those that entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as God had commanded him. Uh, so over and over again, there is this emphasis on the fact that, that Noah's response to this command uh, um, from the Lord is obedience, and that results in, in his salvation, which is exactly what God promised in verse 1. Go into the ark, you and your household, for I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. God promises salvation from his wrath if if Noah what will but come in faith and do what God God had uh, commanded him and it is faith right I mean it takes faith to build an ark on dry land with no water around you right so this is an expression of faith this is not salvation by works this is salvation by faith was talking of, was the fact that you had Noah who walked with God. Noah was righteous. It doesn't necessarily say his sons and his wives and their wives weren't, but it's Noah. It's the head of his family. And when you talk about like the the people that were not invited, mm -hmm. or, they were not invited because they did not walk with God. They were right. not righteous. They they did not submit to God's rule. So it just follows that neither did their children. Mm -hmm. And I know that it's obviously not salvific, but just because Noah was right, it doesn't mean his sons were also. We see that right. both Noah and his sons fell prey to temptations and, yep. and sinned and ultimately, you know, had, there were consequences to their sins. But that was because you see the same thing when they go into the land of Canaan. And when you mm -hmm. read this with your kids, you have to explain that no one, no woman or child survived. And I think in our day, that really hits us because it's like but they're children they're innocent mm -hmm. it's hard to see from like a spiritual aspect but their parents aren't and the likelihood that their children that they have begotten will behave in a similar way yeah that's a general principle so right it's almost yeah. impossible to separate that out yeah there, there certainly are exceptions praise the lord right i mean some of you in this room might not might be believers and your parents were not and the opposite is true plenty of believing parents yeah. Uh, their children simply do not believe, right? But it is a general principle that uh, that I mean, it just shows you the influence, the significant influence influence that parents have on their children. If parents live in an in an unbelieving, unruly fashion, that has a strong impact on their children. It's not irresistible. God can still save those children, and the reverse is true. Righteous parents living in 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 uh, obedience to God's command that has a significant influence on their children. But I mean, we see this with Noah. We're going to see this. Later on, what happens at the end of the story, his own children end up, you know, sh showing uh, clear rebellion um, and sin. We don't necessarily know their eternal condition. I don't think the text tells us that, uh, um, certainly. 
but it definitely is, is a principle. So Noah comes by faith. And again, we see that here in the text, but of course the New Testament emphasizes this explicitly. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7, by faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events at, as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. So if there's any temptation to view the language here in chapter 7 as this was works salvation, works righteousness, because it could come across that way, right? He did what God commanded, he worked, therefore he was saved. If there's any question and temptation, Hebrews corrects that. No, this was, this was salvation uh, by, uh, by grace through faith. And not only do we see clearly it's by faith on Noah's part, but there are also several important uh, themes in both towards the end of six and seven that emphasize that this is a work of a sovereign God. The, you know, think about the animals coming to the ark. God said, gather two of every kind and bring them in the ark. But did Noah like go and get them himself? Who brought the animals? I mean, animals just don't do that. Right. And Noah certainly didn't do that. He tells Abraham or Abraham, he tells Noah to do it. But God himself is the one who brings the animals. And then who shut the door? God shut the door. God provided that means of salvation. And again, if you've ever been to the ark or if you go in February with, with the church trip, uh, they do something really beautiful. I don't want to spoil it, but um, there's a big door. And on the inside, they've they've sort of faded the wood a little bit to make it look like a cross, just emphasizing that that was a symbol. We'll see more of that in a moment, a symbol and a sort of foreshadowing of the salvation possible for those who come by faith because of God's grace through the means that he has prescribed. So this is judgment, but it is redemptive judgment. That is significant. It is, it is a judgment upon the people who have not submitted by faith, but it is a salvation. It is a redemption for those who have come by faith. And again, Peter emphasizes this in the New Testament. If we have time, I want to look even more at this text. But 1 Peter chapter 3 uh, shows parallels between what is happening in this uh, Noah event and with the nature of salvation and the coming judgment. And 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 20 says, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the day of Noah. He's talking about that common grace that's holding back his, his wrath while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. So that same judgment that God finally brought upon the unbelieving people, the prevailing waters that are emphasized in the fourth section and that begin to recede in the fifth section, those prevailing waters of judgment were actually also the waters through which God saved his people. So it was redemptive judgment. Number two, we see here uh, described in the text that this is that this judgment was also a recreation. Now, this has already been, we've already alluded to this several times, but there are very interesting parallels with how Noah, Noah excuse me, Moses, I'm going to get Abraham, Moses, and Noah all straight here one day, uh, with how Moses records the event of Noah's flood, there's parallels with that and with the creation narrative, intentionally so, because what we see happening here in this flood is not just judgment and salvation, but it is actually recreation. In fact, going back to Peter, Second, Second Peter chapter 3, uh, Peter actually describes this, what happens after the flood and as a result of the flood, as almost a new world. There's like a time before the flood and a time after the flood. There's a world before the flood and a world after the flood. I mean, you think about it, only eight people survive and only two of every kind of animal survive. Uh, it really is a new world. And even, I mean, you know, there's some speculation here, but I mean, most, again, conservative biblical scholars like those up with Answers in Genesis argue that the flood even sort of reconstituted even the, the whole earth and the way that the continents are today is a result of the flood. Like, like again, there's, there's evidence for this, but there seems to be that there, that there was, before the flood, sort of one main landmass 
And the flood actually broke up along the fault lines and created the, the, um, the continents as we know them. And that would make sense even for how human beings, you know, were able to get uh, across the, the world because that, that movement might have still be, hap be happening even after the flood. Um, so it is, a, it is a recreated world. Uh, even in this seven structure format of the flood narrative, there seems to be a deliberate comparison to the seven, uh, the seven days of creation. There's a parallel there with how uh, God created the world and how Moses records the, the narrative. And in fact, even having two triads with then a, a climax, it's not exactly the same, obviously, in the days of creation, but there are two triads and then a climax in the Sabbath. So it's a little bit different, but there's still a, a similar sort of grouping between the, uh, the the creation narrative and the flood narrative. And then just think about what God did with water. And this is Peter's whole point uh, in the New Testament, what God did with water at creation and then what God did with water in the flood, right? You remember in the days of creation, it started that water and earth were, to, were together. I mean, water was covering the face of the deep. That's how it started, right? When God created matter. And then what did God do? He separated the waters from the earth. And so most, again, conservative Bible scholars believe that up until Noah, the earth was actually covered by a canopy of water, a canopy of, of vapor. Uh, there, 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 there hadn't been rain, remember, up until Noah. Um, and this may be why people lived longer, because it, that, that canopy of vapor was actually prohibiting the UV rays from entering like they do now and people were living living longer. Again, somewhat speculation, but there's good reason to believe this. So God separated the, the waters from the earth. And then what, God, what did God do in the flood? The heavens came down and water came from the deep. Both things happened, right? That the, the flood was created by God, once again, bringing down that water that he had once separated and flooding the earth with that water. So it was, a and then, and then the water went back up again after, you know, we'll see that in chapter eight when the when the prevailing waters recede, the flood recedes, uh, and so it, it is. It is a recreation that is taking place in the flood. So it is a redemptive judgment. It really is a recreation. It's a fresh start. But as we're going to see, and this goes a little bit to Katie's point, you know, yes, Noah was a righteous man, and he, you know, hopefully reared his children, and we don't know their spiritual condition, but he certainly had an impact on them. But they're all still sinners. And regardless of the salvation of a parent, that does not ensure the, the salvation of the children. So that, yes, eight people come through saved, but then they have children, and those children need to submit themselves to God through his promises just like anybody, and not all of them do. And so the, 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 the two groups of people that existed uh, from the time of Adam and Eve, although perhaps, again, we don't know for sure, but maybe maybe they all, maybe all eight, let's just assume all eight that enter the ark were um, were uh, seed of the woman. Let's just, let's just assume all of them were redeemed. Well, they have kids. Some of those kids don't submit. And so once again, we, we still have these two groups of people that exist um, to this day. So redemptive judgment, a new creation, a fresh start. And then number three, this will be fine in chapter seven, as we've already alluded to a little bit, foreshadows not only the coming judgment, but it also foreshadows the coming eternal kingdom. That kingdom that was promised all the way back in the beginning. Remember God's intent for the garden. God wanted that garden to be a royal sanctuary in which his presence would dwell and his people would be kings and priests, right? That didn't happen. Wasn't a surprise to God, part of God's plan, but that will happen one day, right? One day there will, will be no more sin. The seed of the serpent will be entirely wiped out. Judgment will come and there will be an eternal kingdom where exactly what God intended in the garden will come to take place. God will dwell with his people. Uh, he, he will be our God. We will be his people. And we will serve him as kings and priests over, over the earth, right? That's coming. And it's foreshadowed even in the nature of the ark and what happens here in the protection that is afforded to uh, Noah and his family in the ark. There are deliberate parallels 
You see some of them in chapter six and then some of them here in chapter seven. There are deliberate parallels between the ark and uh, what, what's interesting is there's a backward look to the garden. There's also a forward look to the end of time. And we've already seen this already in Genesis. There's a forward look to the tabernacle because the tabernacle itself is also this representative of the presence of God and the and the uh, amidst the kingdom of His people, with His uh, with His priests leading the people in worship. And even the ark has some has some similarities to this. I mean, think about the nature of the ark, right? You've you've all seen pictures of it, probably seen you know the recreation in in uh, in, in Ohio, Kentucky. I think it's actually Southern Ohio, but anyway, Northern Kentucky. I don't know. Right there on the border, um, but it doesn't look like a sailing vessel, does it? It actually looks like a house, right? It looks like a floating house, and that's intentional. It is supposed to look like a floating tabernacle, representative of this sort of microcosm and foreshadowing of the kingdom of God to come. The the the, the presence of God being with His people, protecting them. Um, it's you know even even the nature of of the three stories of the ark. Um, sort of represent the original creation of the earth where you have the heavens above and the earth beneath and the things that are under the earth right and in the animals what kind of animals do you have you have the birds of the of birds of the air and the the animals of the field and then you have this language the creeping things which may refer to actually burrowing animals right so you had again reflecting creation which was supposed to be a holy tabernacle that's represented later in the actual tabernacle of Israel. All of that is a shadow. All of that is looking forward to the, the kingdom to come, uh, which we are looking looking forward to. Um, the, the, the window of the ark. Look at verse 11 of chapter 7. The window of the ark is representative of the window of heaven. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, in that day, all the fountains of the great deep burst forth, and the windows of heaven were opened. That's what we just talked about. The windows of heaven is that canopy of, of, of vapor that God uses to flood the earth. And the window of the ark is closed to protect people. Uh, you know, protect those eight souls and all the animals from the windows of the heaven. And then the door that God shuts is protecting them from the waters of the great deep. And so once again, this is picturing the protection of the kingdom of God, God's people being protected from even, even the judgment to come upon the enemies of God, all of that working together uh, to, to foreshadow the nature of what God intended all the way back in the garden what he is providing for now in human history through the redemption accomplished by the Messiah, his anointed one, his son, the son of the, of the woman, and that for which we long, that which we are looking forward to, that God will accomplish uh, fully, right? He's already accomplished it, actually. Uh, it, it's, it's a done deal, but of course, we don't see the full consummation of it. We'll see the full consummation after the second Adam comes again, after he destroys all of his enemies in that final judgment, which is very much tied to the nature of the, the flood itself. And so that brings us in our last couple of minutes. I, wanted, I, wanted, I mentioned I want to look at Second Peter chapter 3 uh, even more, uh, just, just kind of park here as we close for a couple minutes. Because 2 Peter chapter 3 deliberately connects all of these things to our present experience right now as Christians. We might be tempted to look back at Noah and say, okay, yeah, I believe that happened, and I kind of see the things that are happening there, but what relevance does it really have for us? Well, we've already seen so much relevance. I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago. You know, there's a lot more in common with our present situation and the pre-flood days of Noah, than even the days of Israel's theocracy, right? There's definitely, you know, importance and benefit of that period, but we're not a theocracy, at least in terms of a geopolitical state. We are a holy nation as a people of God, but we don't have you know, the, the same sort of geopolitical theocracy that Israel did. Really, our situation is very much like the time before the flood of Noah, of Noah. Where we have two groups of people, we have the redeemed people of God, the line of Seth, we have the redeemed people of God in our day, uh, those who believe in Christ, 
And we have plenty of people who experience the, the common grace of God, but who are distorting the common grace of God. It's building, 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 building. And just like what happened in the days of Noah, at, at some point in God's providential plan, uh, the, the time of judgment is going to come. So that's exactly what Peter is addressing in 2 Peter chapter 3. As I mentioned, he's addressing this idea. Uh, notice he says in verse, he, he's saying, I'm stirring up, verse 1, your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the prediction of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and the Savior through your apostles, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing. They will say, verse 4, where is the promise of his coming? Does that sound like the scoffers in Noah's day? What are you doing, Noah? Yeah, right, there's going to be a flood. Well, we have those same scoffers in our day. In these last days, people are questioning whether or not the promises are, are coming. And notice how they're Notice how their scoffing continues in verse four. They say, where's the promise of his coming? What's the rationale? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation, right? It's always been this way. And so what's Peter's point? Has, has everything continued just the same since creation? No. That's what we're seeing right here. That's why Moses is spending so much time from chapter 6 all the way through chapter 8, because this is a revolutionary event. This is something that breaks into the fabric of the run-of-the-mill, day-to-day, normal course of things. And that's what Peter is saying. Their whole rationale is wrong. Verse 5, they deliberately overlook this fact that the heavens existed long ago. The earth was formed out of water, through water, by the word of God. And that by means of these, what is that? The, the water and the word. Uh, by means of these, the world that then existed, notice this language, was deluged with water and perished. That world before the flood does not exist anymore. This is the whole idea of new creation. It's gone. The water wiped it out. But by the same word, the heavens and the earth that now exist, okay? So he's distinguishing between the heavens and the earth that once existed and the heavens and earth that now existed. Pause real quickly, running out of time, but I gotta make this point. This is why evolutionists who make assertions based on their tests right now are so faulty in their logic because they're assuming exactly what Peter is saying here, that it's always been the same way. The very nature of the heavens and the earth were different before the flood than they are now after the flood because of the nature of what happened in the flood. It was a different world, Peter is saying. There was a heaven and an earth that, that, that then existed. That world perished. There is now a world that exists. And this world, so what's Peter saying? Same thing is coming. Now, it won't be a judgment by water. Instead, it will be a judgment by, what does he say? Fire. The point is, judgment is coming. So as God's people, we need to remain faithful. We need to preach the gospel just as Noah did, right? The New Testament tells us Noah preached the gospel. We need to obey what God has commanded us for the salvation of, you know, to, in order to escape the judgment. And we need to trust that day is coming. And we, not, we need not fear that judgment because just like in Noah's day, the very judgment that God is going to send on the earth will be the means of our deliverance for all eternity. And that's the central message that we see here in this narrative of Noah. All right, let's pray. Father, we are grateful for this text that you've given us, really this whole section that we're going to continue in even next week. And we're thankful for the very relevant eternal lessons that you have given us through this narrative. And I pray that you would not allow us to lose hope and that you would keep us faithful, knowing that the day is coming when you will judge all sin and that you will once and for all completely free us from the very presence of sin for all eternity. We long for that day. Help us to live now in light of that day, because you are our king. You are our redeemer. Help us to live in light of that and long for our blessed hope, the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray this in his name. Amen.